Hey everybody, welcome to this special edition of 5 Minutes or Less of EMS. I'm your host, Kevin Mackey. We're coming to you today from the headquarters at Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District. I have two guests with me today. Dr. Garzon. I'm Hernando Garzon. I'm the Sacramento County EMS Medical Director. And Dr. Schatz. I am David Schatz. I'm the trauma surgeon at UC Davis and the Medical Director for Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District. Today's topic is spinal motion restriction. We're going to talk through the policy. We're going to talk through how to use the policy and how to do an exam. Thanks for joining us. Come along. Let's talk about spinal motion restriction. Okay, Dave. When I was a medic, we called it spinal immobilization. Where did spinal motion restriction come from? Spinal mobilization came about starting in the early 60s. Uh, got more established in the 1970s by the American Orthopedic Association, but even they said for indicated patients. As the time went on, it just became much more just that everybody got immobilized uh, to the point that it was way out of control. Um, and now in recent studies have shown um, problems with the, the immobilization, the collar hiding things, the backboard causing uh, pain and mm -hmm. uh, even skin breakdown. So we in the Northern California area decided to uh, select which patients really did need spinal mobilization as opposed to just everybody. We used the criteria that are often used in emergency departments and trauma centers to decide which patients need x-rays and therefore have a high suspicion of injury. Uh, and just decide using that criteria which patients to actually put on a backboard and collar and protect their spine in the field. With that result, we actually dec decreased the amount of, of backboard use by about 50%. Wow. So we accomplished our goal. But now we need to better define for the paramedics in the field what that exam is, what that criteria is. And so we wrote those criteria recently and put into protocol. And that's the purpose of this video, to be able to describe and demonstrate what that exam is and what that process is. Excellent. OK. OK, so based upon that, then and knowing that we've changed things in Northern California, we're kind of following a national model. Dr. Garzon, what's your vision for spinal motion restriction in the county? So in Sacramento, I think our previously called spinal immobilization policy um, kind of reflected contemporary thinking around spinal immobilization, starting with the regional work that, that Dr. Schatz uh, led in here in Northern California. We started to revise and update our policy. Uh, most recently, there was a consensus statement led by the American College of Surgeons with a, a, a number of other national organizations. Uh, specifically on spinal motion restriction. And so the latest version of our county policy is now called spinal motion restriction uh, and reflects the language and the, and the indications and the procedure reflect current thinking. Why don't you walk us through the policy starting with maybe the key indications? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, indications for SMR following blunt trauma include midline neck or back pain or tenderness altered level of consciousness, that is a GCS less than 15 or evidence of in, uh, intoxication. Third thing is focal neurologic signs or symptoms such as numbness or motor weakness. Fourth indication, anatomic deformity of the spine. The fifth indication is distracting circumstances or injury or any similar circumstance that impairs a patient's ability to contribute to a reliable history or examination. So this would include emotional distress, communication or language barriers, age over 65 or less than five, or significant distracting injuries like long bone fractures, degloving or crush injuries, or large burns where the pain and the attention to the injury may distract from the, the pain or the exam on the patient's neck or spine. Additional indications, if none of the above criteria are met, but there's still suspicion for spinal column or spinal cord injury, the patient should be placed on SMR. And in addition, there, there is no role for SMR in isolated penetrating trauma. And Hernando, I think the thing we need to really point out is that the indications for SMR should be the default. So this shouldn't be an excuse why not to put them on a board. The first thought should be, we need to put the patient in SMR, and is there a reason why we shouldn't put them on, and that's what the indications are, or the exclusions to put them on a board and in collar. So you start from the baseline that this patient's getting immobilized. Now I'm trying to talk myself out of it. Yes. Right. So all these indications have not been met. 
then I can consider not doing spinal motion restriction. Correct. Okay. So, so you said, and, and just to clarify this, right, penetrating trauma even with neurologic deficit, because it's done. Yes. Right. Because it's... And pen, that would be penetrating trauma anywhere in the body, like a yes. gunshot wound in the thorax where someone has numb legs. Yeah. Because the damage is already done. Right. Okay. So now that we've reviewed the, the narrative of the indications, let's move on to discuss the technique of assessing the spine and the procedure of doing so. So, if Dr. Schatz, would you demonstrate a, a, a spinal exam uh, for trauma patient? Dr. Mack, you be my patient? I'll be your patient. Fernando, can you uh, take control of the spine for... Yes. Sir, my name's Dave. What happened to you? I was in a car accident. Do you, uh, you get knocked out? Do you remember everything that happened? Uh, I do. Okay. What's your name? Kevin Mackey. Do you know where you are? Uh, I'm at SAC Metro Fires headquarters. Do you know what day of the week it is? It's Friday. Okay, great. Um, can you squeeze my fingers real quick here, both sides? Squeeze hard, squeeze hard, hard you can. Good. Can you feel me touch you here? Mm -hmm. How about over here? Yes, sir. Good. Can you wiggle your toes for me? Yes. Good. How Can you feel me touching down here? Mm -hmm. How about over here? Yes, sir. Good. All right, I want you to let me know if you have any pain in your neck as I, as I go down here in your spine. You any pain up in here? No. How about over in here? No. How about down here? No. Nothing at all? Nothing. No pain. Good. No pain. How about anything now? No. Down here at all? No, sir. Okay, how about here? No, sir. Good. How about down in here? No, sir. On down here? No, sir. Still no pain? No pain. Good. All right. You can let go. Touch your, sh your chin over the left shoulder. Any pain there? No, sir. How about on the right side? Take no, a look sir. up to the ceiling. And how about down to your chest? No Good. pain. No pain. Spine is clear. No SMR indicated. All right, Dave, thanks for that. Um, that walks us through actually how to do the exam. Can you go back and just narrate for us what you were doing there and what you're looking for? Sure. You know, right off the bat, we have to presume there's a spine injury until to otherwise proven. That's the whole purpose of the exam. So having my partner uh, hold your, your C-spine in place while I do the exam is important right off the bat. Uh, I am asking your questions as to what your name was, where you are, what happened. That's all me assessing your Glasgow. You're, you're, you're appropriate, you know where you are. So in my mind, you're a Glasgow 15. That's the very top part of the chart. Um, at the same time, I smell no alcohol in your breath. I'm not hearing slurred speech or dilated pupils. Make me think that you've got, you're intoxicated. So that's another box. We speak the same language, another box. We're able to communicate. So you can give me that reliable history and exam. Uh, once we get beyond that, now we actually, now that I, I check your, near, your gross motor sensor. Mm -hmm. So I'm not interested in is your little finger uh, numb. I'm interested in can you squeeze my hands equally? Do you feel grossly where I touch you in your arms and your lower extremities? And can, I, can you wiggle your toes? If I'm down there and you're, and you're in shoes, I might not be able to see your toes, but I can have you push against my hands and can you move your feet? So I'm looking for symmetry uh, on your narrow exam, both motor and sensory. Just gross, but it's there. So then I go to the spine directly. When I palpate the spine, I'm going down the spinous processes, the bones that are sticking up, and I'm going spine by spine by spine. I'm not doing this little little run down the spine lightly touching. I'm really looking to find, is there any, any step offs? Is there a step in or a step up of uh, the spine where the, where the, the spine might have moved? Um, and I'm looking for tenderness. So I'm constantly asking, does this hurt? That's the tenderness that I'm trying to find if there's a spine fracture. So in that reasonably quick exam, but a thorough exam, I'm walking down every spine in your back and making sure there's nothing abnormal. The last thing we do is then have you, you move your neck, not me, move, you move your neck and I ask you to move as you saw through those four directions. If you can do that pain free, now you're fine. Okay. Addressing like a kyphotic patient or kyphotic elderly patient. Um, mm -hmm you know, or, or you know, a, a cerebral palsy patient, you know, someone who has a pre-existing significant spine deformity. Uncooperative, really wrestling with them to get them into spine, so that drunk that is just flailing, right. that, won't, that won't cooperate. You know, we have to go back to protect the patient, um, and if you, you cannot put them in an abnormal position. So if they're a kyphotic patient, you just have to deal with it somehow. And that's a patient, maybe you have to set the gurney up a little bit, maybe you have to put them on their side, but even on their side, their, st their spine is still protected. Um, maybe that drunk patient prefers to be on their side because they're drunk um, and they're otherwise combative. You do what you can do safely for the patient and for you as the, as the responder to get them to the hospital. Okay. 
There is no clear data for kids. The problem with, and we picked the age of five because that's what we, it's the age we picked, but the real question, can you get a reliable history and exam? We go back to that same comment in a three-year-old. Can a three-year-old tell you what you need to know? So we picked five. And for a 65, we picked that as the upper age uh, because the data does show that as you get older, your perception of pain changes. So they, we've, we've all seen patients that are in their 80s and say they have a normal exam and they're non-tender, they have no pain, but they've got a fracture. So we kind of had to pick an age, so we chose 65. That kind of falls in line with the Canadian C-spine rules too. It does. Isn't there age 65? Yes, it does. Right. It, again, we just, uh, there's, without being hardcore about it, that's, that's a general um, indication for, for, for okay. putting them, for uh, putting them in SMR. Okay, so we covered. Issues with uh, uh, respiratory compromise or facial airway bleeding that may make it difficult to, to keep a patient supine? So if the patient cannot be supine, you can put them up in a reverse trend downward, but the, ba the backboard should be straight. So if you need to put their, elevate their head, just elevate the whole backboard, the whole bed. Uh, they should not be sitting up. Now, if if they're spitting up blood and swallowing blood and there's no other way of doing it, risking the airway, again, you kind of have to play it by ear on that, but the idea is that the spine is always broken until proven otherwise. Okay. So if we determine that the spine needs to be immobilized, the proper procedure is to put them in full spinal immobilization. Uh, so that means the C collar and a firm surface, they should not be upright uh, when they come into the emergency department, either sitting upright or walking with a collar. That is not adequate spinal motion restriction. And we actually happen to have all three of the most common ways that patients are secured on a firm flat surface right here with us. We've got a gurney, we've got a scoop, we've got a backboard. So yep. one of these three ways, and we don't have a KED here, right? Does a KED have any role here? Yeah, so as the bottom of your list. Okay, KED's at the bottom of the list. Right. This is, I, I imagine a KED's going to be used best for a patient that's really banged up, long extrication, Correct. difficult to get them out of a car. Correct. We talked about kind of where SMR came from, and we talked about the indications uh, in the county policy, and we went through the exam, and then we had a discussion about the difficult patients, the tough ones, the ones that are the elderly, the kyphotic, the ones who are young, uh, the ones that are combative. Uh, and we talked about kind of how to secure them, that it's an all or none, it's never a partial. And we approach every patient assuming that they have a spinal cord injury, and that policy is designed to help us make some decision points about those we need to use SMR and those we don't. Correct. I think that's the way I do it, too. Okay. Okay. Did that cover it? Yep. Okay, well, thanks, Fernando, for being here. This has been great, Dave. It's been an amazing discussion. I think that SMR has been one of those topics that's created some confusion in, uh, in our pre hospital providers' minds, and I think this really cleared up a lot of key points. So I really appreciate having you guys here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll see you next time on 5 Minutes or Less of EMS.